Yep. Okay. Could we just do, could everyone uh, just, we could just go in order and just say your name so that we can make sure that we're pronouncing all of the names correctly. Brian, go ahead, unmute. Hi, I'm unmuted. My name is Brian K. Okay. And hey. I'm muting again. Okay, good. Sue Harris. Sofia Sepulveda. Sadika, are you on? Mateos, are you on? Najera? Oh, well. Okay. I'm on, guys. Sorry. Just had my mute. Oh. Mateos, is that? Can you yep, say your name? Just say Mateos. your name. Mateos. 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 Yep, you're saying it right. Say the last name. Chuckle. Chuckle. Anyone else who was on who has not said their name? Okay. So it's Injera. Injera. Hi, comrade. Maya's on. Cool. I'm going to change your. I'm going to change your name again. Okay. Thank you, Injera. Just a final reminder that when you see, um, you should be looking at your screen, you should number one, time yourself, and number two, look for Sadika. When, when she does come on, it means you have about 30 seconds to wrap up. Just a reminder, when we go live, please uh, video off unless you're the moderator or you're speaking.
Check, 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 check. So you have to mute um, Tony, and I'm going to tell her she's on the wrong, uh, she came in on the wrong way. the COVID pandemic from the perspective of progressive and revolutionary healthcare, healthcare workers and community organizers, not just to update people on what is going on, which we already know and complain about, but formulate the path forward to a socialist healthcare system, which we desperately need. Um, uh, Judy, do you want to put up the... Uh, Thing for the join the workers world page that's sue oh okay. sorry sue um so uh, uh sue is going to put up the our for workers world page up so this is a webinar being done by the healthcare workers of the workers world party a marxist leninist organization fighting for revolution if you are interested in joining, uh, go to workers.org uh, and click on Join Workers World to sign up. Yeah, you can go to the Join Workers World page to sign up. Great. Um, so the first speaker is Sofia Sepelda. Uh, Sofia, her, goes, uh, her pronouns are she, her, is a first-generation Mexican-American trans-Latina healthcare organizer for the Texas Organizing Project. She is the co-lead, uh, she is the co-lead organizer for the Medicare for All March in San, uh, San Antonio and the Millions Women's March in Washington. She also co-founded Trans Power San Antonio as a supporter for Medicare for All. Sophia has spoken at panels to make sure that people in Texas continue the fight for healthcare by pushing to expand the indigenous healthcare program, Medicaid expansion, and Medicare for All educational workshop. She will be talking about Medicare for All. Please welcome Sophia. Hello, everyone. And I, as they mentioned, my name is Sophia Sepulveda, and I am the healthcare organizer with the Texas Organizing Project. I've been organizing in San Antonio for about four years. Um, these are parallel times. I really believe the only path forward in this moment is to provide healthcare to everyone. We've seen before COVID 19 the effects of our for-profit healthcare system in communities of color. As a healthcare organizer, I've seen the struggle in many families, a lot of them working 40 hours a week. 
who don't have insurance, and if they do, it is way too expensive to seek care. We've seen this problem increase with COVID-19. Per the CARES Act and what we might heard in the media, we can receive free testing. However, there is a caveat to that. You can only get tested if you have insurance. If you don't have insurance, you qualify for state testing, which they may or may not charge you, depending on your state. Also, you may or may not have to pay deductibles if you are in a state sponsored insurance. You probably won't have to pay treatment. If you are in an employer sponsored insurance, it will depend if you are in or out of network. The system is complicated as it is. We also don't have a centralized system in the United States, so it's very difficult to be able to um, manage this disease and uh, ensure that the pan is, we control the pandemic. We also see a higher number of cases and deaths in the black and brown communities, possibly because we are in the forefront of the fight, right? Like we are grocery workers, we are delivery drivers, we are gig workers, most of whom cannot afford health insurance. The Navajo Nation, as you've heard, uh, is said to become the epicenter and the highest rates of COVID-19 per capita in the United States. We see also today, unfortunately, that Congress, rather than offering Medicare for all with the duration of the virus, they decided to pay private insurance through COBRA uh, to cover folks who lost their jobs. And those, those, uh, those numbers are staggering. About 30 million people have lost their jobs so far. So we need to continue organizing locally, statewide, and nationwide. Locally, we've been working with local officials to offer funding for families who were left out of the care sack. These are immigrant folks, people who work um, but didn't uh, file taxes in 2019 or 2018, families whose kids are citizens but they are not. In there, we pass around $20 million to help with housing, economic relief uh, to those folks. In Harris, we were able to get $30 million uh, that um, actually Lena Hidalgo just is pushing for. And in Dallas, about the same money. Many organizers and folks in the ground were able to push our, uh, their city councils for a $1,500 relief to immigrant folks. And again, those three cities that I mentioned. We are working with the city as well to ensure free testing for all and allocate resources to treat immigrant folks or uninsured folks for free of cost for COVID-19 treatment. Our statement push, our statewide push is to expand Medicaid in Texas. As we have the higher number of uninsured folks in the country uh, through our Sick of It Texas campaign and recruiting other state and national organizations to continue to push for our governor to expand Medicaid as we cannot open the state with millions uninsured. And nationwide, we continue the fight for Medicare for All, pushing our congressmen and senators to endorse the bill. Last year, we were able to organize and push Lloyd Doggett to sign into the uh, bill to be a sponsor. Our goal this year is to get Castro, and we are working with, working with city officials to pass Medicare for All Resolution, stating that Bear, Bear County really believes healthcare is a human right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sofia. Um, our next speaker is Mateo Strickal from the National Nurses United. Mateo uses he, him pronouns and was born in rural Utopia and migrated to Northern Virginia at 10 years old. His mom is a hotel maid and his father is a taxi driver. Growing up in a working class immigrant household and reading about African national liberation struggles helped to spark his curiosity about class struggle and anti-imperialism. In college, he was member of a living wage coalition that won significant raises for campus workers and improvement in working condition. After college, he worked as an organizer with the National Taxi Workers Alliance. Mateos currently works as a labor rep with the National Nurses United in El Paso, Texas, and has been with NNU for five years. Please welcome Mateo. Um, thank you very much for, for that uh, very nice introduction. And um, again, I'll be very uh, brief and I'll try to get into it. So we knew um, from the offset of this pandemic and from our experience in dealing with uh, hospitals uh, with Ebola, for example, and uh, SARS and even the Zika virus, that you know, the hospitals had no planning or no intention of providing any kind of safety for nurses. Um, and in fact, I mean, this is this, it's to be predicted, right? The capitalist, um, I think, logic prevents them from having any kind of long-term 
planning that has nothing to do with uh, profit. So for example, we knew that they would stick to their just-in-time staffing or just-in-time um, stocking of these uh, life-saving uh, PPE. Um, so immediately we did not wait. We started uh, you know, uh, talking to our members, started educating them. Um, and I think our first actions were sometime in early March. Uh, it took us a little, bit of, a little bit of a while, but again, in terms of organizing uh, workers, I don't think there could have been a better time because it, it revealed in a very stark terms uh, in the way in which their employers um, viewed them, viewed, viewed them as just kind of an expendable part of the expense of the hospital and not, you know, an important member of a community. Um, and so, again, we were able to, we started in the ER and the ICUs, nurses, uh, you know, started mobilizing uh, to demand uh, PPE. And again, initially, all of the hospital's response was, we didn't need to purchase N95s or any of these other life-saving, uh, uh, you know, equipment and PPE that you need. You can just use surgical masks. On top of that, they started lobbying uh, the CDC and the federal government to reduce and lower the standards um, that you know uh, nurses and clinicians have worked hard to maintain in terms of what kind of uh, uh, PPE were, was needed. So again, um, but nurses were really upset, and this was the the best way to. I think show them and see their employer is not someone that you know had their best interest at, at hand, but in fact had an, an you know opposing interest, which is that you know instead of for example closing um, you know elective uh, procedures um, and, and dedicating staff to going and taking care of COVID patients, the hospital decided no, we need to open up uh, elective procedures. That's where our money is. Um, so these kind of decisions that the hospital um, you know, uh, made, I think, showed the nurses why they needed to revolt, they needed to act um, to protect themselves and their coworkers. Now, as the virus kind of reached El Paso, um, you know, we, we, we were seeing that more and more of these nurses were being exposed, again, because the hospital wasn't providing them with the necessary PPE that they needed. Uh, for the hospital, it was essentially, uh, you know, decide to uh, invest more money in providing care and protection for these nurses or um, do as much as possible with the few nurses remaining, um, you know, uh, and having them take up more and more shifts. Uh, but this, this was causing a lot of problems because many nurses were being infected, um, they were being exposed and um, had to be, you know, out of the workforce. Uh, so again, we had to go out again on May 1st, I think uh, around 163 hospitals uh, were, went out uh, and protested on May Day. Um, to demand PPE. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Mateos. Um, so before we continue, I would just like to remind people that we do have a, a questions coming up for the speakers later on in the presentation. So if you have any questions, just drop them down in the QA portion. Great. Um, so our next speaker is Brian Shea. Brian uses he, him pronouns and is a peer support specialist helping to organize people who uses mental health services. He has been a member of the Boston branch of Workers World Party since the 80s and works with the party's Disability Justice Caucus. Please welcome Brian. Brian, I think you're muted. My apologies. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, for that generous introduction. Um, I wanted to talk a bit uh, about an organizing effort that's taking place here in Massachusetts by people who use or have used what passes for mental health services. Um, and the organizing effort is aimed at uh, the uh, state funded uh, facilities uh, in terms of like hospitals or psych units or uh, uh, congregate living uh, group home facilities in terms of uh, trying to, demands are being raised for 
transparency about um, you know, the, the, what what uh, the state authorities, the departments of mental health and public health are doing to uh, to make those those uh, those situations safe for people uh, who are uh, incarcerated there. Uh, they are um, they're, they're, they're rising um, uh, uh, number of infections and deaths in these facilities. And what is going on is is folks who have been in those facilities, some of whom work as peer specialists and some of them uh, do other stuff in the community, have been able to organize and are organizing. There was last week, there was a car caravan at uh, one of the largest facilities in Boston that 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 give services to uh, you know poor people, people who are incarcerated, people who are in uh, houseless right now. Um, and uh, tomorrow there's going to be another car caravan protest at one of the largest uh, state psychiatric lockups in the middle of the state. And uh, these have been, um, these are getting some acknowledgement. Well, I mean, they, they, the state has been having to deal with folks who are the organizing for it. But um, in, in a system where people who with any kind of disability uh, are put aside as in capitalism. Um, this is this is this is the way things run. But in a socialist system where people where, where people matter more than profits, where the uh, where where uh, the the people who use the services have a say, you know, have have direct input into what goes on in their lives, and and where the system is is relevant, uh, where you know, in a socialist system, if we organize it. It will be organized according to uh, the needs of the people. Um, if we had workers' assemblies, this would the organizing effort would be much easier. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, so our next speaker is Tegan Strauss. Tegan, its pronouns are she, her. Tragen is a trans uh, woman emergency medical technician and member of the Central Texas branch of Workers' World Party. She's a veteran of the U.S. Navy who hopes to live in service to workers and the oppressed against empire. Please welcome Tagen. Thank you, Comrade Sadika. Um, so we see that a capitalist economic system has proven itself completely incapable and in many cases, unwilling to provide people with adequate health care and economic protections during this pandemic. In contrast, countries with socialist economic base, such as Cuba, Vietnam, and China, are able to meet the demands of COVID-19. This socialist base not only allows for their health care systems to operate with patient and community health first, but to respond flexibly to crisis. We've seen the construction of hospitals, establishment of quarantine zones, retooling, retooling of machinery to produce PPE, and international solidarity in the form of providing equipment and doctors to countries around the world. 
Now contrast with the capitalist system, that equipment is provided without the control of the country that's providing it. It's, they're just doctors who are helping out. Now patient and community health must come first in healthcare. Under this capitalist system, the well-being of people is subverted by the interest of capitalist vultures who prey on the sick. Socialism would provide us with the means of, to establish community control over hospitals and clinics while holding bigoted healthcare providers to, to account. It would remove the financial burden of seeking medical knowledge, allowing people with the passion to care for others to become healthcare workers. Instead of having these skeleton shifts that leave healthcare workers overwhelmed, with patients, with patients and unable to attend each, each of their unique demands, workers would be staffed based on the needs of the community. As an emergency medical technician myself, I can say with absolute confidence that healthcare is overwhelmingly bureaucratic in the United States, with most of my time on a call being spent filling paperwork that justifies decisions made by medical doctors and other professionals such as myself, to insurance companies who've never even met the patient and spend millions of dollars trying to deny their claims. Through socialism, the removal of barriers such as medical patent laws would encourage researchers to cooperate with each other, not just domestically and internationally as well. And this would speed up the process of finding a vaccine for COVID-19 and other diseases as well. Now, socialism involves both an economic and cultural shift from capitalism. Within the border of the so-called United States, socialism absolutely must take on a character of decolonization. A socialist healthcare system that maintains its bigoted and eugenic European heritage is neither socialist nor healthcare for the people. Under this racist capitalist system, patients are frequently denied medical treatment and have their complaints dismissed based on the biases of healthcare workers. Medical theories and practices must also be led by the people they seek to serve and constantly challenge the old ways. It's only through, as Marx put it, the ruthless criticism of the existing order that we can begin to transform healthcare from this bumbling, degenerated capitalist system where insurance companies challenge decisions made by doctors and medical practices are rooted in profit motive and bigotry, excuse me, um, to one that puts the healthcare, health and well-being of people first. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Tegan. Um, again, I would just like to remind people that we will have a Q&A portion. So if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A section for our panelists. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the panel so far. Next up, our speaker is Maya X. Maya, her pronouns are she, her. Maya is part of the Workers' World, uh, she is part of the Workers' World Party a revolutionary student, cultural activist, warrior poet, Marxist, comrade and ally. Please welcome Maya. Thank you. Greetings comrades, allies and community. First and foremost, I extend a resolute yet somber acknowledgement to and for all those lost during these times. In addition, I extend full power solidarity to all on the battlefield in the struggle. You are and have been essential workers and cadres long before this current period of the COVID-19 pandemic. My brief remarks are meant to reintroduce the stories of self-determination, self resistance, and resilience, which continues to guide revolutionary praxis in this and previous heightened periods of struggle. In 2008, I was introduced to a model of storytelling via a project at Barnard College that outlined four types of stories, the stock stories, the concealed stories, the resistance stories, and the counter stories. Due to the brevity of our time today, I will briefly share three examples of resistance stories that sometimes have been concealed. If you would like additional info on any of these topic areas, please feel free to let the organizers know and we can email that to you. The first example is the CDRs from Cuba. CDR stands for Committees in Defense of the Revolution. The mantra in every barrio revolution, founded by Fidel Castro in 1960, rooted in community and collective responsibility, 
providing comprehensive health, wellness, and political education. To date, over 133,000 CDRs have served and mobilized more than 8 million Cubans on the island. The next example is the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, established in 1966. The, health, the party's health care clinics, activism, and advocacy was informed and anchored by socialism and its principles, which were mirrored both practically and philosophically. The health clinics also provided access to wraparound services, including housing, social supports, nutritional, via the free breakfast programs and access to groceries and et cetera. It is known, one of the concealed stories is that the WIC program of today was based off of the programs that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense created. And programs and examples like these have extended to our class behind the wall of mass incarceration via the demands of um, our, our class at Attica in 1971, the historic September 9th to 14th, where the, where the comrades came together, and as well as the organizing that continues today behind the wall. And so I would like to end with this um, quote from Aboriginal activists. It says, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Aluta Continua. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Maya. Uh, next up, our speaker is Nanjira Keith. Nanjira uses she, her pronouns. Nanjira is a, 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 a diaspora-oriented diaspora Black organizer who focuses in the development of movement philosophy and infrastructure that supports cohesion and unity in revolutionary struggle. In 2017, Nanjira published Sovereign Song, Words from the Revolution. She is the founder and former executive coordinator of Black Sovereign Nation. She is also the co-founder of 400 Plus One, a Black cooperative federation, a liberatory blueprint, and a framework for dramatic economic and political shifts in global Black life. Please welcome Nigeria. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Nigeria with 401. Today I'll be for focusing on how reproductive life is factored into revolutionary strategy. 401 is leaning into a foundational theory of change that centers reproductive revolution, a phenomenon we define as reclamation without appeals to the state of the physical, psycho-spiritual, and cultural resources required for equitable and transformative reproductive life. To better understand what reproductive revolution entails, it's important to name what reproductive oppression is. Reproductive oppression is the exploitation and control of physical life, especially that which is directly related to reproduction. So capitalism, heteronormativity, and um, the neglect of those who are not able-bodied are all facets of reproductive oppression. We have to intentionally center Blackness and the eradication of anti-Black racism and reproductive revolution. Um, beyond this, 401 also places a strong emphasis on eradicating the system of assigned gender at birth, on subverting the power dynamic between adults and children, and on pleasure deprivation as a tool of reproductive oppression. We continue to advocate for abortion access and understand that the state's infringements on that access can and often do exacerbate the material condition of oppressed people. That being said, we believe that abortion access is something that must be undergirded by autonomous power and sovereignty as opposed to the legal apparatus or the state. We think this because before Roe v. Wade, there was little to no acknowledgement by people pursuing legal protections for bodily autonomy within the context of abortion of the exploitation, violence, experimentation, and genocide that Black bodies have been subjected to by the state. Um, we continue to see the erosion and reversal of reproductive rights within the context of the law, as well as of many reproductive rights that have never been protected. 
So what does reproductive revolution look like in practice? Um, we have to be prepared to develop a revolutionary vanguard that will help leverage people power in the name of reproductive equity. For 401, practice has looked like the development of a seven-year training program, um, our child infrastructure project, um, not using pronouns and spaces at all, and a reproductive health care curriculum that can help people claim their reproductive sovereignty. Um, reproductive revolution in practice also looks like imagining the systems that will replace the ones we currently have. We can look to Cuba, to Vietnam, and to China for some examples of central government supporting and developing infrastructure for universal reproductive health care. Um, abortion access, for example, is much less restricted in those countries. It's even more important for us to acknowledge and learn from indigenous practices that support reproductive life. In conclusion, a reproductive revolution is a complex process that we must undertake with courage and imagination. There are many factors I can't cover in three minutes, but I think the greatest emphasis should be on dismantling, reimagining, and rebuilding. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Najira. So uh, that is all of our panelists for today. And now we are entering the Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, we do have some interesting questions that for our panelists coming up. I think the first question I would like to ask is, uh, and someone asked in the chat as well, uh, is are there any upcoming events or campaigns coming up that uh, you would that people can support? And any of the panelists can answer that. Um. This is Sofia from San Antonio. So yes, we actually have an action coming um, on um, Thursday, July, um, May the 28th at 6 p.m. as a Facebook Live virtual town hall. We're going to be talking about um, COVID-19 as a threat on Black and Brown communities, especially in Texas. We're going to have um, city councilmen speaking about um, what can we do as a community. We're going to have a, um, the public health uh, director from Harris County, and we're going to have an epidemiolo epidemiologist from Harris County, Dr. Stephen Ch um, Chow, which is, he's an amazing supporter of universal healthcare. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, all of the panelists can come on camera for the Q&A portion if they would like. Um, uh, this is a question for Mateos. Uh, what about non-unionized uh, nurses? Are there campaigns that uh, people are working on to unionize nurses? What's like the status for it? Yeah, um, I think during this pandemic, we probably had a significant increase in, in kind of workers interested in organizing, um, you know, way more than I think our union has the capacity for. Um, but I don't think there's been any time, uh, certainly in my, my time here, five years, there's been this level of interest. Uh, currently, um, uh, almost 2,000, about 1,800 8, registered nurses in Asheville, North Carolina, which is not, uh, you know, I don't think we have a single hospital there unionized, um, have started organizing to form a union. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the, the corporation has tossed you know, significant amounts of legal and regulatory um, challenges to try to slow things down. Um, they're spending millions of dollars on, um, when things were shut down, they forced their union busters uh, to stay uh, in the hotels there, just so they, again, the, in the midst of a massive pandemic, the hospital chose to spend money um, attacking the workers and their efforts to form a union was supposed to you know, actually you know, putting money into the care that the community needs during this time. Thankfully, the, the nurses are very strong. Um, they're in a very good position. Uh, but again, you know, it's, uh, it's very tough, but uh, I think they, they do, you know, Zoom meetings with over 100 registered nurses every week um, as part of the organizing committee. Uh, and, and they're still doing actions. You know, again, I think one thing that differentiates our union for, from many others is that we know, and we know from history that, um, you know, the, the current labor relations uh, uh, regime in the United States was a major concession that workers were uh, had to give up. Um, but in fact, you know, uh, our, our power lies in collective action inside and outside the hospital. Thank you so much for that, Mateos. 
Um, are there any other anyone else who would like to add on? Um, sorry, uh, no, actually the next question. Um, this question is, how will it be possible for Medicare for all to get organized in the US as it is to, uh, today? Uh, and any of the panelists can answer that question. During COVID-19, you mean today as the digital era, the new normal? As during COVID-19. As, um, as an organized, a Texas-based organization, what we've been doing uh, lately is contact folks who have been coming to events for the last two years and kind of reconnect with them, not only to organize them, but also ask them those um, important questions, right? How are they doing? How, how is their family doing? If they need anything, the resources that we can provide them and then invite them to participate on whether it's an, a meeting or a call to action or even a workshop. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've been having a lot of success. We did a um, virtual rally, which was pretty amazing on um, May the 5th. And it was to push our governor to expand Medicaid. As you know, Texas has one of the highest number of um, uninsured folks in the country. And that's because neither Perry nor um, Abbott want to expand Medicaid. And, and though we understand it's just a little bit, we're only going to be able to um, cover 1.5 million folks in Texas, which is less than uh, the 5 million uninsured that we have is a, a, a step in the right direction, right? That doesn't mean that we're not uh, organizing and um, Medicare for all and ensuring that everybody has health insurance. So uh, we were able to bring together around 6,000 to uh, 6, 60 to 100 people to the rally. We were able to generate around 700 uh, tweets to the, to the uh, governor to make sure that he not only expands Medicaid, but closes the state. Texas is one of the states who decided to open, right? Despite of the fact that we have the highest number of uninsured folks. Also, a lot of our testing facilities are mostly on depressed communities who happen to be black or brown. So we are um, demanding our city officials and our healthcare um, officials here in not just in Bear County, but in Harris County and in Dallas County to move those testing sites away mm -hmm. from those communities mm -hmm. who more than likely have no access to healthcare. So that's what we're doing is mostly um, events like this to make sure that we are, um, and I don't like to use the word educate, but inform our communities about the necessity of having a universal system that protects us all. It doesn't matter the race, economic background, or uh, gender, right, or sexuality. Everybody has to be covered. So um, doing events like this, ensuring that we are doing those uh, calls that sometimes might be uh, intimidating, but they are super necessary when it comes to organizing, it's organizing especially now during COVID-19, because we cannot go knocking on doors like we used to before. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Sophia. Um, if anyone else has anything else they would like to add, please do so. Again, panelists, you're more than welcome to turn on your cameras. Also feel free to give people your information, your organizations, links, et cetera, events coming up in the chat for everyone attending. Um, so one of the other questions we have gotten is, how could organizing efforts be made easier during COVID, uh, just in general for healthcare workers? And any of the panelists can answer this question. Brian, I think you're still muted, Brian. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, okay, can you hear me? Great. Okay, great. I think, um, well, one step would be workers' assemblies. Uh, a workers' assembly would be um, where people can go. I, I mean, the organizing effort that's going on here, for instance, uh, among folks who have used uh, mental health services or what passes for them. Uh, Folks are under no illusion that the state is gonna, you know, just, just, just say, oh, 
course, you know, we're gonna make, you know, we're gonna do whatever uh, you need to to make people safe and and keep people safe in this pandemic. Uh, but if we had a workers' assembly of people who, you know, locally, yeah, locally and nationally, you know, if if we were able to bring uh, their situation to the attention of the assembly, we go to a meeting, get on the the agenda, and uh, you know, we could have like, you know, like the the next couple of days, we could have 200, 300 people, whatever. You know, stand you know outside the facility demanding the changes that uh, you know the the workers and oppressed people in those facilities need, and it would be um, a um, it, it it's 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 a lot of some of the benefits you know come from to those who were doing the organizing, and some and some of those benefits would be uh, as a means of creating dual power almost, uh, uh, um, you know, creating another pole uh, of uh, of exerting influence. You know, you have the system, and then you have the people that the system does not work for, and that is organizing to, uh, yeah, you know, you're creating do another poll, which can attract people to it. That's, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, would any of the other panelists like to answer that question? How can organizing be made easier? during COVID and in general. I'll, I'll be very brief. I've, I've already spoken, I, I didn't wanna, but I think I just wanted to give you something concrete. Um, with NNU, um, we're doing these, uh, we call, you know, it's not at the advanced level of uh, workers councils, but we have what we call uh, Metro councils. Um, this brings in uh, union and non-union uh, nurses across a geographic area um, and helps them to organize um, for uh, improvements in their in their workplaces and then hopefully eventually lead them to organize their workplace. So please um, reach out to the National Nurses uh, 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 United that work online. And so um, you know through that you're, you you can sign up for one of these metro councils. So even if you're not a, a you know actively in a unionized place. Uh, you can, you know, you can get resources from them, and then you, again, our union has a, uh, you know, we don't expect the hospitals to provide with accurate scientific information, for example, with regard to what kind of PPE, so the union has developed its own um, uh, uh, hygiene department that, uh, a nurse, nurse practice department that does this kind of education, um, so please, if you have nurses or anyone that, you know, that's interested, um, go on the website, and you can quickly plug in. But again, the Metro Councils, they are a body that doesn't just advocate for uh, nurses, right? Advocates for the community. So we're often uh, involved in fights around uh, um, not only healthcare justice, but also environmental justice, racial justice um, uh, as well, so. Thank you so much, Mateos. Um, this is a question for Nigeria and Maya. When we build community clinics, how do we avoid falling into the trap of nonprofit industrial structures? And this is for Nanjira and Maya. Um, so this is something that uh, we've given a lot of thought to. Um, right now, we try to uh, emphasize and develop autonomous industry. So to support um, autonomous healthcare initiatives. So for us, that looks like a lot of agriculture. Uh, we do a lot of farming work. Um, we do a lot of community gardening. 
uh, that supports the revolutionary initiatives that we've taken on. And I think that um, something similar could be used for um, bigger uh, community health clinics. I think also um, thinking about how we sustain what we call now uh, medical professionals uh, would be, could be important. So um, I know in Austin, there was a community clinic that was completely volunteer run uh, by doctors and nurses. It was only open on Tuesdays and Thursdays and you could show up, stand in line and the doctors would see you, the nurses would see you uh, free of charge. Um, and so I think that these autonomous industries could also be used to continue to support those types of efforts, right? So if we know that we have a group or a collective of um, healthcare workers who are willing to share their skills with community, we need to find a way to sustain um, those healthcare workers that is not uh, reliant on capitalist initiatives or um, foundational support. Um, so that we can avoid falling into the trap of um, being driven by the billionaire class or the nonprofit industrial complex. Thank you so much for um, that. This is Maya. Go yeah, ahead, this Maya. This is Maya. Um, I definitely um, support to what um, Sister Injera has just said. And you know, one of the examples I remember, um, they say back in the in the 60s when the when the Panthers formulated, you know, the, the concept around creating the party and looking at how are they gonna be able to sustain themselves, that they were selling like copies of the little red book for a dollar. And that allowed them to be able to acquire the resources needed to be able to purchase arms and purchase other material things that were needed. And, and so I think it's really being, in a, you know, as we see technology and innovation advancing how people are able to connect, but also knowing that there's some foundational ground, you know, stuff that we can do that's on that more tactile level. And um, I'm familiar too with um, uh, the FTP out in Atlanta, almost over 18 years now, you know, when Brother Kalanji and, and others created the dollar a month club. So if you had a dollar, you know, and you were able to, to donate and, 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 and be able to um, assist with building an organization, because what they found in the creation of the organization was that if you needed assistance from the capitalist system, you know, oftentimes you weren't able to get that you know, they had all these requirements and eligibility and all of these things. And so they literally were like, you know what, we're not gonna participate in that. So when you have the community buy-in, you know, whether that's monetarily or through the, you know, volunteering, whatever that, whatever that currency or capital is that the community holds, that's a way that you maintain that sustainability because, you know, the great Steve Biko said many years ago, you know, whoever feeds you owns you. And he was talking about that from that concept of like, you know, if you're going to these like government institutions and these government organizations and programs, you know, oftentimes as, as we see foundations, they dictate um, your policy and, 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 and your programs. So I think just that community buy-in is, is, is so important. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Maya. Uh, again, we're still accepting questions uh, for the panelists. Um, and some of the other questions we have is, uh, can you give examples of how profit is an obstacle to getting healthcare? This is for all panelists. Um, yeah, I can, I can answer. Taken. Okay, thanks. Um, so whenever like profit comes into play in terms of healthcare, um, you know, the profit motive takes over everything and every aspect of what happens. Um, it happens in other industries as well, like food production, things like that. Like profit no motive is number one. Um, everything else gets set secondary. Now, um, in terms of like what's profitable versus what's it, what's in the best interest of the people, um, 
you know, we, we've seen skeleton shifts already with nurses who, um, even during like COVID-19, they, they're like completely overworked and overburdened, but they're not hiring nurses to replace them. And they're not hiring new cleaners, new laundry people, everybody else. And like, everybody's just like, like we're getting furloughed in certain areas um, and other areas are getting completely worked to death. Um, so we see like, they're just trying to get that profit out of us, like maximize our patient contacts. Um, we frequently have um, instances where in my job, we'll be transferring a patient over to a nurse's, uh, like a bed in the hospital and the nurses will be in such a rush that they'll like start rushing us through the patient move and we got to like stop them and be like, hey, they have a spinal fracture. Like we can't just yank them over. We got to slow down. And it's that like that profit motive started before they even got on their shift. Like it, it's what makes them be so overworked and forget about things like taking care of the patients and all that because they have like 30 other patients to take care of within that hour and they can't spend time like you know, slowing down to take care of one when they got so many others to come in place. And there's also like a, a lot into it on the industry side of it, how pharmaceuticals get distributed and how research is done and things like that. But I don't want to take up too much time and start going into that. Um, maybe I can like write something on it later. Thank you so much for that, Tegan. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to answer be, be, before we move on to some other questions? Sophia, are you at, like thinking about I love, this? I love the question again. I, th I know it was for profit industry of healthcare. Yeah. So the question is, can you give examples of how profit is an obstacle to getting healthcare? Oh, definitely the death panels, right? Like we keep on hearing that um, universal healthcare will provide us death panels. We keep on forgetting that we have insurance companies that are precisely that, right? Like they're the ones who decide whether you get treatment, whether you, um, or, or whether you don't get treatment, right? I, um, I was hearing, I was listening to a podcast um, this morning called uh, An Arm and a Leg, and it's uh, based on the healthcare um, system that we have now. And, they were talking about that um, this woman who had COVID-19 and she had to and she had to go to the doctor, right? Because they couldn't give her the treatment until she tested for a uh, flu and a cold, right? And then um, after she tested a negative for flu and a cold, they had to uh, she had to come back to take a COVID-19 test, and then after the test was positive, she was able to go and get treatment, right? However, the hospital did charge her for the cold and flu test, right? And uh, there was another woman who got uh, a negative result, but then ended up actually having COVID-19 that just the, the negative results were a false negative. And because there was a negative result, she ended up having to pay $2,000, right? And, and it was all over the news to the point that the insurance actually was able to, um, not charge her those two hundred two thousand dollars because supposedly on her city treatment or uh, not treatment but testing was free. So that that's just an obstacle. We also seen um, many folks who have illnesses or some sort of um, uh, uh, sickness and they refuse to go seek treatment or go to a doctor because they are afraid that they cannot afford to just go. Uh, to just go see a doctor. I met this man who lives in the south side of the city of San Antonio, who is 75 years old, who is in Medicare and in, in Medicare Part uh, B, right? So he, he buys uh, insurance and still has to contact his son so he can get $400 for his healthcare medication. He was crying when he said, I'm 75, I'm on social security. I shouldn't be asking my grown son to, um, to lend me money to afford my medication. So these are the injustices that we see, especially in communities of color that we most of us don't have access to healthcare. And before I was working for um, sex organizing project, I didn't have insurance. Why? Because it was way too expensive. And even if I could afford it, the, the, the deductibles alone at $8,000 would make my insurance unaffordable. It was just a card 
an illusion that I could get healthcare when I knew I couldn't. Thank you so much for that, Sophia. Um, so again, we're still accepting questions and we're getting a lot of them. So I hope the panelists are okay answering them. Um, one of the questions we got is, could panelists comment on the problem that the intake forms for COVID-19 testing ask people to only ID gender as female or male? This is for all panelists. As a trans woman, sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, maybe somebody wants to answer this, but as a trans woman, I, I know, I mean, I would not be comfortable going to get tested if somebody's going to not call me my gender, my preferred gender. But that's just me, right? Like, so that, that will prevent a lot of uh, folks, which I know those folks who might, who are going, who have gone to the doctor and because they call them their dead name or they call them uh, ma'am instead of sir or sir instead of ma'am, they stop going to the doctor. So it is a, de a detriment especially for uh, for the trans community uh, to get access to to something as simple as testing. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, Tegan, would you like to go? Um, yeah, so um, also as a trans woman, it's, it's really frustrating to um, constantly see those boxes and, uh, you know, like not just for trans men and trans women, but for our non-binary siblings as well who like that choice is not a thing for them. That's like, they're not male or female. Um, and, you know, this includes the indigenous two-spirit people and people who just like don't exist within the gender binary of the white supremacist European capitalist construct. Um, and that just goes to show like the legacy and the heritage of the medical system we have um, in the United States is completely rooted in colonialism and erasure of indigenous cultures and erasure of like, like who we are as just people. Like, like we weren't running around in the woods and like doing hunter gatherer stuff, deciding like what gender we are and stuff like that, like based on birth, like people just did that based on like what their behavior was. And, um, you know, that's just like a continuation of that, the capitalist system, like placing us all in these convenient boxes and setting us all up for reproduction and all that, um, that we can, they can just control us in that manner. Um, so that's why like, we really need to challenge that and reject that within the medical system. And, you know, in certain cases where there's doctors who continue to uphold it, even like after we have a socialist vanguard in place and all that, they need to be out, like get rid of them if they're backwards, like send them to re-education camps, do what you need to do teach them their ways, um, fix them if you can, get rid of them if you can. Thank you for that, Tegan. Um, so we have more questions. I hope you guys are up to answering them. Uh, one of the questions we got is, what long range gains and change do you think will result in the healthcare system as a result of the COVID crisis? do you think we will see major radical changes? I think that um, we are seeing a um, focus and emphasis on mutual aid right now within the context of public health. And I think that that is um, a huge benefit to revolutionary movement, to revolutionary struggle. I think that right now, um, socialists and revolutionaries as we have people focusing on this concept of mutual aid and as they are maybe just being introduced to um, mutual aid we should continue to undergird this theme of autonomy and give more examples of how mutual aid and autonomy can um, be a response to the material condition of oppressed people um, so i do think that we could see a real a uh, radical healthcare movement um, grow out of um, the outbreak of coronavirus. I think that this is um, connected to uh, a theory of destabilization that 401 holds dear. You know, we think that um, the state and capitalism have developed such, you know, tyrannical control of 
people and the way that they even relate to their own material condition that sometimes it does really take a deep destabilization of those folks' connection to systems of oppression in order for revolutionary movements to kind of carve out space to demonstrate how alternatives can work. And so we see that happening right now. We see people learning and seeing and demonstrating that alternatives can work. And if we're talking about how this can happen in the long term, that is our work now, right? That is our mandate now to build on the momentum that autonomous um, movements are, are developing and benefiting from right now. It cannot be a, this thing happened organically and let it be and everything you know falls to status quo or wherever we were as organizers before this moment. Um, it definitely has to be that uh, we continue to exacerbate um, the, at least the, um, you know, heightened awareness that people have of the failure of these systems um, and help folks imagine something different. Thank you so much for that. Um, would any of the this other- Maya. Oh, go ahead, Maya. Um, yeah, uh, and, and to like give an example of, of what um, Sister Njera just said, you know, um, recalling the, the movement and the struggle and the deployment of, of resources in, in, in terms of material aid and, and bodies and organizing when we were fighting to get um, hepatitis C medication for Mumia. And, and just in terms of the, the radical strategies that were taken and, and Mama Pam talks about how Pam Africa talks about, um, you know, having to engage the pharmaceutical companies, having to engage different people across the healthcare sectors. And, and then the, the struggle expanding where it's not just about Mumia getting access to the medicine, but also for anyone that was incarcerated in, in the Philadelphia um, industrial prison complexes and, and other um, residents who um, had, uh, were low income or didn't have the resources. And you know, the system was like, no, we're not gonna give Mumia that medication. He's not gonna get it. You know, it's too much money. It was all of these different things. But to see what happens when we as a people, to, to quote um, A. Philip Randolph, you keep up the pressure, you apply more pressure and you just keep applying pressure and, and, and really building those autonomous systems. And then, you know, you see, you know, with Attica and, you know, George Jackson and, and, and others, and even Mama Asada talks about this as well, the organizing around healthcare that happens behind the wall in, in terms of, um, I'm told from the, the, the research at Attica that, you know, the, the people behind the wall got together and they decided, you know what, the system uses race and other identities to try to separate us but because of the, the dire conditions, it was either death or more death that they were facing, that they created what was known as the convict race. And under that umbrella was able to organize, create these demands and, and, and forge a resistance that, you know, was able to see what we now call um, the Attica Rebellion. And, and so I think that's really important when we think about like, it is, it is more than possible to create these systems that whether they're parallel you know, or autonomous in its entirety to really combat you know, this, this capitalist healthcare system because we've seen it where you know, when our, our class behind the wall is in need of assistance and we're able to deploy and leverage our movement to do what's necessary um, we sometimes get the results that we need to, to um, achieve. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have a lot more questions. Uh, this one is for Mateos. People around the country have been inspired by the brave wildcat protest action of nurses and other healthcare workers. How can people around the health uh, around the country find out ways to support National Nurses United locals when they plan actions? Um, okay, it's an interesting question. So you know, 
Uh, unfortunately, I think um, we have, you know, we represent nurses all over the country, but where we are concentrated tends to be places like California, um, uh, and then OC itself has has grown. I know one of your your members here was a founding member of NNOC in Texas as well, um, and, and parts in Florida. Um, but you know, again, uh, you know, uh, our footprint is is not as as wide as as we like it to be just yet. But you can. I mean, I, I'll tell you, uh, pretty much all of the facilities that um, are that we've organized that are owned by HCA. That's the Healthcare Corporation of America, which is the most profitable healthcare system in the world. Um, I think they got something like $4 billion in accelerated payments from uh, the stimulus, in addition to 700 million, um, none of which, by the way, were uh, earmarked for its PPE or any kind of safety for, for nurses. So we're doing planned actions next week, uh, Thursday and Friday, uh, around the country. Um, so that's something that you guys can support if it's happening, if you live in, especially Texas and Florida, um, it's something that you'll definitely see. Um, and, and so we hope that you can, you can support them. But I think just this is a bit more of the question from the previous uh, uh, um, person. But, you know, one thing that I think I, I sense will change with this union and with the work that we do is, so before the pandemic, um, the NNU leadership, so the board of directors, registered nurses, um, did a tour. So they, were, they went to Cuba um, as part of a kind of a, a learning and education process to understand the community clinic, clinics and to understand the way in which, you know, how is healthcare run um, without uh, a capitalist system um, when human need and human um, interests are, are placed above that of profit. And so a lot of our leadership, a lot of the nurses that, um, you know, attended uh, were completely transformed. And I think for them to experience the contrast uh, where they're going back to these hospitals and, you know, the, hearing from the corporation that um, they're not going to get any safety mechanism, that their safety and their health is literally the last thing on the list that they care about, um, I believe will, will change things dramatically. Um, so, so I'm hopeful in terms of that, that, that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, so please, we were very active on social media. Um, so if you can't be there, you know, to support from your car, um, you can do so via um, our, our, our social media uh, account. Thank you so much, Mateos. Again, for the panelists, please feel free to put links to events, links to website, social media, anything you would like the attendees to know in the chat. Um, we still have a lot of questions, which is great. Uh, so I'm gonna ask the next one. Uh, this is from someone who said, as a disabled activist, what do you think workers' assemblies would look like and how would we organize them? Brian, I think you're speaking and you're muted. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Um, in, my, in my own work, uh, I would think that um, a, a, a workers' assembly, you know, to, to being would would be a place where we could break down isolation. One of the main things about uh, um, having a disability in this particular white supremacist capitalist society is the isolation that is enforced, especially on on nationally oppressed people, people of color, uh, you know, LGBTQ people, you know, marginalized people who have disabilities who are proportionally more um, disability and less resource to work around it in the society. A workers assembly would um, be a resource where that people can use to organize and mobilize and to get support for the organizing and mobilizing that people 
are doing to change their lives and each other's lives. Um, uh, and and it would all it would also be um, a yeah it, it would be a locus of, of people's power um, as a way of but that would only be true if all of the uh, means of communication are accessible to people. Uh, who use it, whether you, um, whether it's your closed caption, whether it's uh, uh, in, in interpretation in other languages, whether it's um, uh, physical access, um, or I mean, it, yeah, it, 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 you know, in terms of uh, accessibility to these Zoom meetings. Uh, whether it's, uh, but there needs to be communication in both directions about what people need, how could people best participate. That's, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Brian. Um, so, so one another question we have is from a delegate to the San Francisco Labor Council and a retired letter carrier with the Postal Service. Their question is, do you think we need to build solidarity between frontline workers in different industry who are continuing to work and be possibly exposed to the virus? Postal workers, meat packing workers, delivery workers, healthcare workers, and et cetera. And this is a question for all panelists. Um, uh, okay, I'll start us off. Um, absolutely, I, I, I do think, um, you know, especially in this time, uh, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I know nurses, uh, and, 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 you know, Tegan mentioned uh, healthcare workers, um, you know, are, are faced with a lot of, um, you know, stress and, and, and challenges in the workplace. And um, anytime we can kind of connect workers that are in the same uh, situation and kind of, you know, build uh, along with each other um, is, I think, a very positive thing. I know we work very closely with our uh, Central Labor Council here. We're close with the Firefighters Union um, and, and kind of, you know, trying to, to build uh, solidarity. Um, but I think that's honestly the only way I can see that we can ensure the safety uh, and well-being of, of essential workers, because I don't think other than lip service and calling them heroes and, you know, what, what, what not, there are, you know, there's no intention in actually providing the kind of resources and the protections that essential workers need to, to, to live. Um, so, I, so I believe, I, I think that is very important for us to, to, um, to, to, to work together. Thank you so much, Mateos. Uh, Tegan, would you like to go? Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, just to kind of continue what uh, Mateos was saying there is, um, I think like a role that the like us healthcare workers can take within this like potential effort to unite uh, broader working class movement is to uh, is to use our like the respect we get from people and our position as experts on health. Um, now that respect is limited by the capitalist system and like what the media is exposing them to and what the CDC wants to put out, which is the CDC is controlled by capitalist interests. Um, but we like when we unite and step forward for the health of other workers, it says a lot. Um, we really need to like start organizing around uh, the meatpacking industries and other industries that are affected by this and to come out and say like, listen, like we are medical professionals, like we like this pandemic is ravaging these people. You need to do something about it. And like, just abandon the old way of like sticking your nose to the ground and just focusing on like the patient only when they're in front of you and not like when they're out there uh, working their regular jobs and things like that. Like we need to incorporate the material conditions that people live under 
into our healthcare plans and into the things we advocate for um, instead of just sitting there and like waiting for them to get sick and show up at the hospital to start taking care of them. Thank you so much for that, Tegan. Um, I hope y'all are not getting exhausted from these questions, but I think they're great questions. Uh, so this is a question for Nanjira. Um, it's a three-parter question. Uh, what is the current state of reproductive justice? How do you see the increased restriction of abortion services being defeated? How can supporters help? And how do you see the path forward uh, for reproductive? For, repro uh, re for reproductive justice. Okay, so the current state of um, reproductive justice we can find in um, the current state of public health, especially for uh, Black people uh, globally and in the United States. Even the way that Black people have been impacted by COVID-19 speaks to the state of reproductive justice, right? So this is why um, it's really time for us to have more community developed um, responses to healthcare needs, right? This is why uh, we cannot trust the state. We cannot trust um, the economic elite to take care of our people, right? So the state of reproductive justice is abysmal, right? When we're thinking about reproductive justice, we're thinking about reproductive equity. We're thinking about everyone's ability to uh, live a healthy and happy, thriving reproductive life. And that requires us to not be exploited by capitalism first and foremost, and you know, Obviously, we're not there, right? We're all exploited by capitalism. Black people are especially exploited by capitalism. And their bodies, there's a, there's a wear and tear on their bodies that's associated with the stress of being exploited by capitalism that absolutely negatively impacts um, their reproductive life, right? The same thing is true about um, state-sanctioned violence, right? So the way that the uh, state is even responding to the outbreak of coronavirus is state sanctioned violence. Again, it's negatively impacting black folks. Um, on top of that, we are still experiencing other types of state sanctioned violence and these are assaults on reproductive life, right? So we recently saw, you know, Ahmaud Aubrey um, hunted and murdered, right? We're seeing, we saw, um, several black folks murdered by the police, right? So um, that is related to the state of reproductive justice. Um, and so for me, it's time to move away from some, move away a little from the concept of reproductive justice because reproductive justice, while a huge improvement from the initial focus on reproductive rights, um, still maintains this conceptual relationship with the state and an expectation of the state apparatus as it currently exists to meet the needs of um, people, to meet the needs of our communities. Um, it, we have to focus on people, power, and autonomy. And that means beginning to develop what we need in our communities using cooperative economics, using mutual aid, and being prepared to defend what we build, right? So reproductive revolution is about with or without the state, we are going to meet our um, reproductive health needs, right? As far as um, continued restrictions on abortion access, um, I really think that what we're seeing happening during the outbreak of COVID-19, these states who are using this pandemic as a political opportunity to um, suppress, to inhibit access to abortion um, is the perfect example of how our health, our reproductive health will never be protected by this state apparatus. There will always be political opportunities, right? There will always be moments that can be exploited and taken advantage of by the state. And that's what we see happening right now, right? So when we're thinking about um, how 
um, inhibited abortion access in this moment relates to reproductive revolution, um, we have to see our enemy um, for who it is. And we have to see their strategies for what they are, right? Um, as far as um, carving a forging a path um, to move forward, um, again, I think that number one, we need to identify what is reproductive equity? What is reproductive freedom? And as some of the other uh, panelists mentioned earlier, um, this is gonna take a complete transformation of society and specifically the healthcare industry. The healthcare as an industry is a huge problem in itself. Then when we're talking about the ways that assigned um, gender at birth is undergirded by this healthcare industry, when we talk about how capitalism is undergirded by this healthcare industry, we're really getting to the meat of what do we need to change, right? And so um, I think that it's time for us to use imagination. It's time for us to think about um, how we divorce ourselves from this norm that has been established for us and um, begin to, to develop strategies to protect uh, what we are able to build and manifest from, from that which we imagine. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Um, so we have one more question. Uh, my community has released statistics of an alarming rise in child abuse and domestic violence reported since the COVID-19 shut-in. How can we include these in our writing and discussion about the pandemic? And this is for all panelists. Um, you know, I, I, I'll speak briefly to this, but um, so, you know, I think the way to do so is by um, understanding, um, I think, uh, uh, domestic violence um, issues uh, of abuse um, as uh, not, not, a, not only, a, you know, I think in this country, we tend to look at it from the framework of, uh, of, of criminal justice or, or, or as a, crim a purely criminal activity. Um, and you know, again, what what, tend to, what tends to happen is in situations where we need uh, social workers, where we need um, you know healthcare workers um, to go and visit, and, 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 psych and psychiatrists as well. Um, you know, again, uh, and this is from what nurses reported to to us from their trip in Cuba, is that you know where you have uh, uh, you know. Um, a nurse, a doctor that lives in the community that provides care, you know, and holistic, complete care to the individual and not just kind of, you know, uh, let's put you on this drug um, and sedate you. So I think if, if we're able to reconceptualize what kind of society uh, that, that we want to build and live in, then I think we have to expand our imagination to include that, you know, in issues of, of, of this nature develop, we have to provide um, you know, and oftentimes it has to do with, with an underlying economic situation as well. When people are having to compete for scarce resources, um, you know, I, I believe is, is when, when, when uh, we're, we're, you know, often seeing this, the, the issue of violence. So I think the best way we can deal with it is, again, to provide, um, you know, with our children. I think right now, um, you know, most of the nurses I work with have had problems, for example, accessing childcare services. Um, we know we have students and kids that are going um, without uh, a, a meal, you know, that, that they're used to uh, getting at, at the school. So I think if we're able to look at it in a more comprehensive way, um, you know, again, maybe this is either through uh, workers' councils, uh, metro council, or, or um, uh, other, other vehicles, like other, other ways to, um, you know, the community themselves, to, to address these issues as opposed to um, the only, you know, again, uh, option being just calling the police and, and police coming and killing us really is, is what's happened in, in a lot of our communities. Then I think we can at least begin to have conversation about how we can um, provide care, holistic care uh, for the total person, the total community. Um, it's, it's... Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you 
so much for answering all the questions for everyone. Um, so unfortunately, attendees, if we couldn't get to your questions, I'm sorry about that. But due to time constraint, we're going to move forward. So for the panelists, um, you can take one minute if you have any final remarks you would like to make about healthcare or anything you would like any of us to know. Uh, please do so. Uh, again, don't be afraid to talk to your friends. Don't be afraid to talk to your um, uh, neighbors. Uh, contact your elderly right now. Um, a lot of elderly folks are feeling alone because they cannot be around people. A lot of disabled folks are feeling alone because they cannot be around people. Call them, check in on them, make sure that you are in constant communication with these folks, right? Uh, staying in one place can be detrimental to mental health, right? So it's, it's very important that we continue talking and reaching out to our community and talk about the movement, not just, hey, how you doing? But hey, we are doing this and we need you there because without you, we cannot move forward. Thank you. Oh, Tegan, would you like to go next? Um, so I'd just like to say, and uh, this is something that um, Jared has actually been talking about like all day, um, and it's something I'm like a huge supporter of, and this idea I've been like having for a long time that's already been done by the Black Panther Party and others, um, is that like if there's any healthcare workers watching this right now, um, I really encourage you to link into the communities you live in. Um, to link into revolutionary organizations and see what you can you can do to help. Um, start a medic group in your area that provides free like, first aid, healthcare, anything you can get away with um, to people. Um, I won't go into specifics on what you can get away with, but you can get away with a lot. You know it. Um, and like we really need to begin the process of getting people the healthcare they need, regardless of. The consent of the capitalists. Um, you know, we need doctors to step forward and be willing to take risk. We need medics, uh, EMTs like myself, technicians, everybody to just take risks for the people, um, for the greater good of the revolutionary movement, not as individuals, um, because that's just going to land you in trouble, but as a organization, get together um, with your fellow workers and start talking about getting out of this capitalist way of thinking and into a revolutionary mindset. Thank you so much for that taken. Um, who would like to go next? Or I'm just going to call on people. Uh, Brian, do you want to go next? Sure, thank you. Um, very briefly, um, we need to be about about mirroring the kind of society that we want to create um, in, a, in our work, in our organizing work. Uh, you know, we need to be, to address issues of uh, isolation and relationship violence and stuff like that. We need to be about strengthening relationships with each other and um you know getting in talking real about uh misogyny and white supremacy and everything that splits people apart uh the is isolation of folk with disabilities you know comrade tegan was talking earlier about eugenics that is a very that is a, 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 a ideological tool used by the capitalist system. Uh, it was developed in the, the 18th, 19th century here at you know, Harvard. And then it was brought over towards, you know, used as a model for genocide in Europe. And it was always used against folks with disabilities, folks who were poor, folks who uh, whose labor couldn't be exploited readily. 
by the capitalist class. Um, that's just, just some things to throw out there. I'm not gonna take up too much more time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, uh, would anyone else like to go next? I just wanna say that I know this is a moment that can feel hopeless for many of us, but these are the moments um, that can be catalysts for uh, momentum in our revolutionary struggle. So in this moment, as we're seeing the world fall down around us, um, it's a time for us to um, build from the ashes what we'd like to see. Um, it's a moment to resist um, systems of oppression, exploit vulnerabilities, right? Right now we see a vulnerabilities in the system. As organizers, we see this is a moment where the masses can also see vulnerabilities in the system. We have to exploit that vulnerability and use it to the advantage of revolutionary struggle. And I hope everybody watching and participating in this is ready to do that. Thank you for that. Uh, Mateos, would you like to go next? Yeah, I think the only thing I would like to add is just what everyone else has already said. Um, moments like this don't always come. And if we're not um, you know, taking advantage of this moment to organize uh, people uh, to, you know, to, to revolutionary politics, um, I think uh, it'll be much harder af after the fact. Um, we know our communities are the first to be devastated. Um, and so we need to, to be out there talking to folks. But again, I think everyone else had, had really um, hit the nail um, on, on everything else I wanted to say. Thank you for that. Uh, Maya, would you like to go give your final remark? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if Maya just stepped away or is not there. Uh, so once again, thank you so much to the panelists for coming and doing this amazing presentation for us and answering questions. Uh, as well as for everyone who attended. I hope this was informative and you guys got what you wanted out of it. Um, so once again, this is a webinar being done by the Healthcare Workers of Workers World Party, a Marxist-Leninist organization fighting for revolution. If you are interested in joining, go to www.workers.org and click to join the Workers World Party to sign up. Hi, comrades. I was on mute. Sorry about that. This is Maya. Oh, it's okay, Maya. Just, yeah, if I could just briefly, I want to echo everything all of the other panelists have said, and then I want to just, just like bring in the, the words and spirit of Comandante Fidel. In his remarks, he said, what we did yesterday taught us that nothing is impossible. After all, what seemed impossible yesterday was possible today. So nothing will seem impossible tomorrow. Aluta Continua, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Maya. That is a great way to end. Um, so once again, if you are interested in joining Workers World Party, please just go to workers.org and click join Workers World Party to sign up. We hope you had a great time at this panel. Uh, there are information about the organizations that presented in the chat. Uh, thank you all, and I hope you are safe and well, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank, thank you, you all. You guys thank you very did much, amazing. Thank you. Wonderful job, everybody. Just wonderful. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you for watching. Viva la revolution.